Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Melbourne Jewish Book Week. I'm Nicholas Brash, the director of Melbourne Jewish Book Week. And I'd just like to start by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri and uh, Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which Melbourne Jewish Book Week is based. And I'd like to pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge and respect the traditional owners of lands across Australia, their elders, ancestors, cultures and heritage. Tonight, we again partner with Jewish Quarterly to bring you an interview with one of the international contributors to this latest issue. It is my pleasure to be introducing you to Lauren Elkin. Lauren is a writer, a translator, a teacher of literature and creative writing, holds a PhD in English. The, the list is endless. Originally from New York, she's just moved to London after more than 20 years living in Paris. Her most recent book, number 9192, A Diary of a Year on the Bus, reflects on part of her Paris experience. And in this latest issue of JQ, she has penned a review of the work of the SAS Vivian Gornick. She will um, obviously speak about that, her book, and way more. Because interviewing Lauren tonight, we also have the pleasure of having Tully Lovey. Um, Tully is a committee member of Melbourne Jewish Book Week, a critic, a writer, public interviewer, uh, and one of her review essays will be appearing in a future edition of the Jewish Quarterly. So without any further ado, I hand over to Tully and Lauren. Thank you, Nick. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Lauren Elkin. Lauren, as Nick has already said, is an American born writer, cultural critic, translator, and formidable flaneuse who lived for over two decades in Paris. Lauren's writing has appeared in such esteemable publications, including the London Review of Books, the New York Times, Granter and Harper's, and she is contributing editor to the White Review. Her book, Flaneurs, Women Walk the City in Paris, New York, Tokyo, Venice and London, attracted many accolades. It was finalist for the 2018 Penn Diamondstein Spielvogel Award for the Art of the Essay, a New York Times Editor's Choice and Notable Book and a Guardian Best Book. With the joy, within the joy of its hybrid form, Lauren walks through these cities both physically and through the mapping of female writers and thinkers who have preceded her. Reading it is as stimulating, as revivifying as it is to wander streets and enter simultaneously their past and present. Her most recent book, number 9192, A Parisian Bus Diary, published just last month, is an audacious book of observations of the people and the city from the view of a bus over seven months between 2014 and 2015. It is deceptively slight, part memoir, part cultural critique. It is vivid with intelligence. Keridwin Dovey says it is poetry in motion. Lauren's marvelous translation of the newly discovered Simon de Beauvoir novel, The Inseparables, released this September, allows English readers access to the great feminist writer's exquisite exploration of the intensity of female friendship. And here in the latest copy of the Jewish Quarterly, we are fortunate to read Lauren's musings on Vivian Gornick's collection of essays. I am so very happy to welcome you, Lauren, into this space that sits between morning and night, this room that might be in Australia, but which is instead perhaps everywhere, this liminal space birthed from a pandemic <coughs> with the potential to be a market square for ideas. And here I sit in a suburb in the city of, Mel of Melbourne, as which Nick has already acknowledged is the place that is part of the traditional lands of the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people. And there you sit in London. And I know it's early days, seeing as you have only recently moved, but how is London working on you this time around, a city you have visited and written about before? Hi, first of all, thank you so much to for inviting me and to you and to Nicholas for that just so, ugh, lovely introduction it, it's really it's really really amazing to hear people in Australia you know talking about me and my work it's it's mind-blowing really um, and I'm really grateful to Gemma Burrell at, at Tableau 
for asking me to send her something. And it just happened to be at exactly the right moment that I had just sent this book to Chris Cross at Semiotex. And I was like, well, I have a weird little bus book that you might be interested in. And I knew about Gemma from Paris and I knew she loved Paris. So um, it's just kind of crazy to me that this, that this is happening. But anyway, so yeah, I, I, am, I, am, I, am, I am also in awe of the way that um, Canadians and Australians do this land acknowledgement at the beginning of literary events, or I guess all events really, um, because as an American, this is obviously a massive, um, I don't even, there's no word to, to, to massive genocide, massive blight on our history that our, our nation exists on the land that properly belongs to other people. Um, and we don't do land acknowledgements or maybe in like California or something, but you know, certainly not in New York where I'm from. Um, so I would like to acknowledge that I'm sitting on the land that traditionally belongs to like the Earl of Belsize Park or, or whatever, you know, aristocrat decided to claim all the land for themselves and make, you know, people pay them tithes to stay on it. Um, so London, yeah, as you, you might, you might, uh, you might guess from that, that little anecdote. Um, I, I have ambivalent feelings towards London in the true sense of the word. So on one hand, you know, I have some real problems with it. Uh, with the United Kingdom's, you know, with the monarchy and the way that society is organized, um, uh, especially around issues of, of land ownership and the way that, you know, the physical space is, is, um, is organized. Um, but at the same time, I do really love London. And as you alluded to just then, I have a long history with the city. I've been coming here for many years from Paris. I had family here and then I was involved with someone romantically here for a long time. Um, and then now, no, we, my partner now, he teaches at the University of Liverpool. And so it was an agreed upon midway point between Paris where I live properly when, at, when I'm at home and Liverpool where he has to teach. So we, we have found um, a happy medium here and it's lovely. It's, um, it's, a, it's a city that at the beginning when I first started spending time here years ago reminded me a lot of Queens. Um, it felt like an outer borough. Everywhere was an outer borough, except maybe for like the city or Westminster. Um, all the neighborhoods were like, you know, the buildings were fairly low, lower even than Paris, which is a city, you know, famous for having a, a limit on how high you can build. But still, the everything was like houses. Even the sort of high street, it was all houses, and then um, you know, commerce on the ground floor. So it took some getting used to to think of um, a place that seemed like an ancillary you know, like something next to a city or, or a borough of a city to, to re sort of realign the way I was looking at it and, and begin to think of it as the city itself. Um, and now I'm just like, you know, I live not far from Hampstead Heath and I'm just completely gaga about my neighborhood and everything you could do here. And, and you know, after the, the bit of time that we spent in Liverpool, London seems like, you know, heaven on earth. Mm. I've been following you with this. That sounds terrible on social media a bit. <laughs> that sounded scary for a minute. Um, and I think, you know, seeing it feels like you're noticing the changed terrain at this st stage in your life. And it makes us think about how the work city works differently on an individual at different times of their lives mm -hmm. and how we, what we might need from it or what we seek out is constantly shifting. Yeah, completely. And, and that's something that I could not um, uh, understand or process when I was writing Flanners. Uh, my agent at the time was a mother, is a mother, and I remember her asking me when I was sort of drafting the chapters and thinking about how to put the book together, you know, how do you think that your point of view on the city would change if you were a mother? Are there any mothers that you, you could perhaps write about? And I remember at the time really trying and like thinking and going, God, I don't know. I, it's, it's so embarrassing in retrospect, but there was a limitation to, you know, where my imagination could wander. Um, and that limitation was motherhood. Um, and even in the early days of motherhood, when I was in Paris with my son and pushing him around in his, in his pram, and I was like trying to think, okay, how is this affecting my experience of the city? And the only thing that I could come up with was like, well, it's really hard to push a pram around on cobblestones. 
Um, there's a moment when the baby's like, ah, this is fun. I like the, bump, the bumps. And then there's a moment where you're like, oh God, the baby's sleeping. <laughs> and all I've got to go on is this bumpy journey. <laughs> but even, even then I couldn't appreciate how it was changing my life, you know, from the inside to, to have a baby in the city. And it's only really in the past, like maybe six months or so that I've started to reckon with how my life is kind of changed in a very serious way and to appreciate that um I mean you know so we've left Paris for now and I, I hope that we'll go back at some point when you know jobs and visas allow us to but um I'm actually sort of grudgingly okay with not being there because I realized that my Paris self was this young woman who wrote Flaneuse who was you know footloose and fancy free and and much closer to the Flano figure that I than I would have admitted at the time. Like I did have a lot of time to just go where I wanted to go and, and didn't have to be anywhere. I didn't have that sense of like, there's, there's a painting, I think the artist is Gertrude Abercrombie um, of like a, a little baby tiny owl sitting on like a tree trunk and it has like a piece of pink cloth on in its mouth and then stretching out to the side, you can see it's like someone's, the hem of someone's dress. And that I feel like describes my life right now. Like my baby's this tiny owl with the hem of my dress in his mouth and I can go wandering, you know, in some kind of circumference around him, but no further and not for very long. Um, and it's, and it's joyful as well because, you know, it's not just an obligation. It's that he's the center of my world and and I just like adore being with him and staring at him and touching his little baby cheeks and you know also it's it takes up time in a way that I couldn't have anticipated and you're like oh okay when's it gonna be bedtime like mommy wants to get to work um so yeah it's it's all of these different and conflicting experiences of time and space and um self and and place and so yeah, I feel like in Paris, I wasn't able to really integrate motherhood into my experience of the city or what I wanted from the city. So it's actually kind of perfect to land in a new city and to have the city sort of bear the imprint of motherhood or, or take the shape, take a certain shape around this small owl sitting on a tree trunk. Mm. Oh, I love that owl. <laughs> from owls to, from owls although at, the, at times I know that owl so well and actually I wish sometimes that the dress wasn't quite so firmly clutched <laughs> um, but let's talk about Vivian Gornick your piece in the Jewish Quarterly explores her recent collection of essays taking a long look essays on culture literature and feminism in our time in this essay, The Personal Journalism of Vivian Gornick, you refer to her as one of the of America's foremost essayists. Why do you think this is? I think she's such an incredible um, observer. And I think that's really the primary uh, job of the essayist is to be observant and to notice things. And then from there, to be able to sort of think them through and you know worry them over or elaborate them into something and because Vivian Gornick is so attuned both as a person in the world and as a reader um I think she's she's just like irreplaceable like her what she hears what she notices what she thinks to write down um I think that it's she's been so influential that I hadn't read her yet. Well, I hadn't read her city stuff yet. I'd only read her literary criticism when I was writing the bus book. But when I actually, you know, seriously properly sat down with her city writing for this review and read, oh God, I'm, I'm completely blanking on the name of the essay that begins, um, I'm sorry, my Vivian Gornick books are back in Liverpool. So I wasn't able to like pull them, pull them out. But there's one essay that begins her like, you know, most important book about cities and you know I can check on that later and get back to you um I felt like I'd already read it and I felt like it had already influenced my book and my way of seeing and I was like she's so in the water of how I've learned to write about cities from you know reading other people writing about cities that it, I couldn't believe I hadn't read her before and I was like well of course of course this is like just Vivian Gornick's way of looking at the world that's that's kind of trickled down to me through other writers 
Um, but yeah, I, there's, I had a couple of quotes that I pulled out um, that I loved from that, the new collection, Taking a Longer Look. She has, in the introduction, she writes about um, how she, when she was a young girl, her, her, her teacher stood her up in front of the class and said, this young girl is going to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And she knew it and she believed him and was like, well, of course, yes. Um, and so she started trying to write from a very young age, but for her, writing meant fiction. It meant trying to write stories, make up people and have them do things. Um, and it didn't feel natural to her. And she felt very, you know, like she couldn't make anything good. And eventually she came to realize that for her, the, the, what the voice that worked or the, the persona that worked as a writer was what she calls the unsurrogated me. You know, in fiction, people can protest this all they want. It's always, you know, you sort of imagining yourself into different situations. Um, but in nonfiction, you're there without a surrogate. I mean, it might not be you per se, but it's, it's definitely you projected into the world instead of you sort of in some other guise. Um, and so I think she's very effective at joining what she says, a point of view to a voice. And that, that specifically, that combination of like looking at the world and, and a way of speaking is what I think makes her very special as a writer. Mm. Lauren, we know th um, that Gornick's writing story is substantially shaped by the history of the feminist movement. Do you wanna speak a little bit about that? Yeah, she she writes also in, in Taking a Long Look that um, when she was first starting out as a writer, she sort of ended up falling into journalism and attended a very early meeting, I think maybe in 1968, of what would go on to be known as feminist consciousness raising groups where women got together and talked about their lives to one another and actually realized that they that there were patterns in the in in their unhappiness and in their perceptions of persecution and that you know this kind of getting together in a room and like sharing one's complaints was actually a really important um tool because it was you know it gave you like a place to start from to start organizing from and you know doing activism from and more than that i think it gave gornick herself as a young woman a feeling of community and um, a form of solidarity that I don't think that she had known before. I mean, in like capitalist post-war America, women are pitted against one another and, you know, you have to be prettier than everyone else or thinner than everyone else or get a better husband than everyone else. I'm thinking specifically, you know, in her day, although, you know, the first two are definitely still true today. Um, and you're not, there's, you're, you're meant to be sort of catty about other women and call them bitches and all sorts of misogynistic language that that we're just impregnated with and that as a feminist you learn to question and you know think twice before you call someone a bitch and think about what you're actually saying and who's speaking through you um, and so I think for Gornick finding that kind of community and solidarity was a way out of that kind of um, inadvertent capitalist way of being in the world. She also has a book about the importance of communism for her in her life. Her parents were communists. Her father was like a staunch communist. And she writes about the romance of American communism, you know, just before and during and after the Second World War. And then and that book is also kind of a disenchantment with, you know, with the movement and, and its kind of weak points as well as its strong points. But yeah, so I think for Gornick, feminism was a, a way of finding community in the way that she'd seen her parents find community um, amongst like, you know, Jewish immigrants or the children of Jewish immigrants in New York who, who became affiliated with the communist movement. Well, I know, we know this about Gornick's career and it being shaped by this movement because she's been writing for decades. So it's almost unfair of me to ask, but mm -hmm. I wonder if you think there are particular historical forces which have worked upon you similarly up to this point in your career. Work similar political forces that have shaped me? Just any kind, um, because you, you, you are writing out of certain events, um, mm -hmm. particularly in the prison dust, bus diary. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's anything or whether it will be the pandemic, you know, to come, whether that's what's 
kind of percolating now? Um, are they there, or is it the feminist movement now? You know, are, mm. are there things that are that you think are really informing your mm. work? or have informed your work today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the work that I've been doing recently, the book that I've been working on for the past couple of years, I think is partially formed by my experience of motherhood. My, my son is three now, so he's been around for as long as I've been writing this book and partially informed by um, the Trump presidency and the Me Too movement and specifically um, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings and the treat treatment of Christine Blasey Ford, um, those were really kind of formative moments for me as I was writing this book and feeling just blown away by, um, I mean, so, okay, so to come back to Vivian Gornick, she's writing about feminist consciousness raising in the late 60s and 70s. She eventually gets a bit disenchanted with the feminist movement as it kind of, as she knew it, the second wave movement kind of disperses and moves on to other things. Um, and likewise in our own day or, you know, circa 2017 when everyone was tweeting hashtag me too, this happened to me too. I remember feeling very cynical, like, you know, maybe this has changed things for Harvey Weinstein or like has made men across America fear for their jobs. Um, maybe it's made them be more careful, hopefully, in the workplace. But I just started to feel like watching Christine Blasey Ford giving this testimony and seeing what they were doing to her and saying about her and then seeing Brett Kavanaugh's testimony. So she's like an upper middle class white woman, clearly poised, educated, articulate, hyper articulate, gave this very professional accounting of what happened. I mean, if anyone is going to be believed in terms of telling their story, it's going to be a rich white woman who's hyper educated and, you know, knows her shit and doesn't devolve into hysterics or whatever. And then Brett Kavanaugh literally devolved into hysterics and was like crying and talking about beer. And like, he was like, he was, he was, he was the opposite of what would have been seen as believable for a woman. And so at that moment, I thought telling our stories is a con they're trying to get us to talk about ourselves and then they accuse us of narcissism or unreliability or you know we're too perfect we're too poised there's no way that women can speak and tell their stories under this regime that is going to break through and make some kind of difference so it's made me um a lot more invested in like anarchistic modes of art that completely shake up the way that we think about the world and that sort of refute story, the importance of story um, in its in the way that it's commonly understood because story is kind of some a way of giving a shape or form to experience that is recognizable to other people. Um, the kind of traditional Aristotelian, you know, shape of, of uh, something with a dramatic arc. Um, I just have found that I've wanted to write this book about art that works against that and, and says no to that and asks, what would women's work be if we didn't have to be getting men to believe us or be impressed by us or you know make a story arc that they can recognize and sell for us I'm thinking there of um Siri Hustvet's book The Blazing World um yes exactly yeah precisely that is a book that I have only read about half of because there is an image speaking of you know work that's so anarchic that it you know totally torpedoes your way of thinking about the world there's an image of a ghost in a window and it was so vivid and visceral that I went, ah, and I was like haunted for weeks and I haven't gone back to it, but I know that I need to. <laughs> that is so interesting because I uh, think that ghost in the window is actually from her personal experience as a child. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that, that would explain it, the viscerality yeah. of it. No, um, I think she's one of the most brilliant writers out there. You know, I would love to write about Siri for, <laughs> for whoever wanted me to, but I think her it's it's a tribute to how powerful her work is that it that it brought me up short and I like couldn't go anywhere with it after that. But yeah, I know that I need to revisit that book for this book. Yes, I do. Um, you quote from Gornick's Unfinished Business. It came to me that what I wanted badly was to put the reader behind my eyes see the scene as I had seen it, feel the atmosphere as I had felt it. 
Was this something that resounded for you in terms of your own approach to nonfiction writing? Yeah, completely. I think that, you know, we, we all, whether we're writers or not, go through the world having these experiences and then we want to share them with someone. I think that's, you know, why social media is, is so popular because it's a forum for, you know, Joe Schmo to like tell all the other Joe Schmoes what happened on the bus that morning um, <laughs> and have it mean something. It's not just about like, oh, I want to be listened to, though it is that. It's also like, what does it mean that I had this experience on the bus? And it, it was my morning and it shaped my morning. It shaped my day. It shapes me on some level. Um, there's something so, so like basic in that human desire to like transmit something. And maybe that takes the form of a story and that's fine. I don't, you know, inherently have a problem with stories, but it's, it's, it's intriguing to me that, that some writers have this desire to put the reader in, in their spot, in the place in the world that they were. Um, and it's definitely something that I share, but I think it's, it's, it's an impulse that goes beyond even the, the desire to create a book and towards the desire to create, you know, community or recognition or solidarity. Well, it's also the desire to be seen, isn't it? Or because mm -hmm. it's our version of what the world is. And by, by having someone encounter that or understand that, it's sharing ourselves with them as well. Yeah, exactly, precisely. You claim of Gornick she feared solitude yet craved it in equal measure and quote her from approaching eye level, never am I less alone than alone in the crowded street. I'd like to talk about loneliness and solitude and its relationship to the writer who must wrestle with the balance of being in the world so they have what to write, not merely the material but encompassing the kind of development of self and then taking themselves out of it in order that they can write. And I'm thinking particularly of some of the artists you examine or look to in Flanners, so Virginia Woolf, Agnes Varda, Sophie Carl, Rebecca Solnit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this, this wrestle for them? Yeah, I mean, I think Wolf is probably the iconic example. You know, she's everyone, well, maybe not everyone knows Room of One's Own, but most people can quote from a Room of One's Own and say that what a woman writer needs is, you know, 500 pounds a year and a space of her own in which to write. And that's certainly true, although not everyone has, you know, the kind of inheritance that, that Wolf had to draw on. Um, but what people quote from a lot less frequently is her street haunting essay, where she also feels this opposing need to get out into the city. And, you know, in, in, on the occasion of that essay, she's, she's made up an excuse to go out walking in the city and it's to go buy a pencil on, you know, somewhere sort of on the other side of Bloomsbury. So she goes out walking at the end of the afternoon, sort of when day is turning to night, it's winter, it's chilly, the street lamps are beginning to be lit. And she has this transformative experience of being out in the world that similarly plays on what I think you're, you're, you're talking about where she says, um, you know, when we're in our homes, we're surrounded by the things that make us ourselves. We've chosen them, they reflect some, some element of our, our past experience. Um, but when we go out into the world, we become anonymous, part of this, you know, anonymous horde of people tramping around town. Um, she says we become an enormous observing eye, I E Y E, but also, you know, the letter I. And I think that that tension, you see it throughout Wolf's work. It's really animating. I mean, I guess it's a version of Wordsworth's, you know, the poet has to, you know, work in solitude. Like the poetry is the recollection of extreme emotions, you know, in solitude and calm. Um, there's something about that dynamic that I think is very important to the creative experience, not just for women and not just in cities, but the city is really just, you know, for me, the, the epitome of feeling like I can dip out into the city. And, you know, like the other day I went, I unexpectedly got off at Euston instead of King's Cross where I was meeting someone and walked for 20 minutes and had all these little experiences, you know, I walked past these guys at a place called the Cock Tavern. And one of them, as I'm thinking Cock Tavern, haha. Um, and one of the guys is going like, 
there's not a person in the land who doesn't know about this pub, you know, like in that really like salt of the earth accent. And I was like, I didn't know about it, but now I do. And we just had, a, you know, you didn't, you don't know that I had a moment with you, but you know, I think it's funny that you said that. And then I passed like what sounded like a marching band, but then I was like, oh, maybe it's actually for Diwali. I couldn't tell. And then it sounded kind of French and then it sounded kind of Spanish just in the span of like the 30 seconds that I'm walking by and it, it was like a few streets down. And so, you know, these, these are not like momentous moments. It, it's, they're just like things that I passed in the street, but it, it gave such texture to my day and it shapes my experience of London and the way that I think about what's possible in London and the kinds of people who live in London um, or even my idea about the kinds of people who might live in London shaped the way I heard the this possible marching band. I would never think in London that you would I would hear a marching band. I'm much more um, ready to hear like Diwali celebrations in London than a marching band because that seems too continental. But you know, anyway. So that's I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's well, how I think, I it, think it does. about it. Well, it's one of the various ways you could go, right? And um, so. I wondered if you could speak to us about this idea and your own relationship with loneliness and solitude. There's a point in number 192, Par Parisian bus diary, where you have just had a conversation with your sister during a traumatic part time in your life, just prior to receiving some devastating medical news. Your sister tells you not to worry. Those are the exceptional cases, she says, those are the outliers, you're going to be fine. You then write, I didn't want to say, but I've never been an in liar. That is such a startling, stunning line. And I wonder when was it in your life that you realized you weren't an in liar? <laughs> oh God, don't the like outliers just know from, you know, <laughs> earliest days, you just know, and, and it's fine. And, you know, you can take some, I think lots of outliers take a certain amount of pride in being outliers and some, some outliers really struggle with it. I know I did when I was a kid. Um, and yet, you know, like I remember being at the lunch table in like fifth grade, something like that. And I had a book with me and I was reading my book and it was just, like <laughs> in retrospect, it's like, if you wanted friends, perhaps you might've spoken to some of the other humans at the table instead of being like, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> and I just think, you know, I don't know. I, I felt more affiliation with whoever was in the book I was reading than the people that I was with in the room. And I think that is probably, you know, that encapsulates the, the experience of the outlier. Um, but, you know, it, it is, it is a lonely experience to be, for example, you know, I hate the word expatriate, but like an, an immigrant, um, a foreigner, and it takes a lot of energy to, to learn the codes of the place where you've moved and to learn how perhaps not to like pass completely, um, but to kind of navigate the day in a way that doesn't make you stand out. And so I had gotten to that point in France where I felt more or less like assimilated and, you know, my behavior had adapted and my accent was just about there. Um, and then, you know, something like that happens and it just reminds you, if, so that being an ectopic pregnancy and ectopic literally in Greek means like out of place. So, you know, it was just a reminder once again that, that I was out of place and and impossible to be placed because you know I'm from New York but New York is no longer home I don't know it anymore I'm, I've spent you know two decades plus in France and have French nationality and you know a whole French life and so it you you're no no once you've left home and spent a lot of time somewhere else even if it's not a different country you know you become partly of that place that you've been in and still partly of the place where you're from so it creates this kind of hybrid identity that cannot be, you know, happily put in one particular geographic or cultural slot. So now we're in London and our son goes to French school here. And that I think is my, that is my country, my son's school, <laughs> where everyone speaks a mix of French and English. That's where I feel at home. <laughs> um, I wondered actually if we might go back because you, you brought us back to your fifth grade self. Um, but I wanted to ask you about cultivating the look, you know, that the, as in your look, mm -hmm. 
the look of of the writer, and um, you speak in Flanners about being a daughter of that of an architect, and mm-hmm. one of whose teachers was Louis Kahn, which is mm-hmm. quite amazing. <laughs> it stopped there, right there. And you wrote, I can't remember a time when I didn't think about buildings, about spaces and their meanings. Do you want to take us back there? Sure. Yeah, that's so funny. I was just thinking about my dad this morning and and how he builds things and and like contributes to the, I mean, cityscape, not cityscape, but, you know, out on Long Island, he he contributes to the the suburbscape. Um, And yeah, I think you know, whatever your parents do, if they're grocers or politicians or whatever, you grow up around their lives and the kind of the stuff that they surround themselves with and and that they make their living from. And so for me, it was always like those tubes that you put, that you roll up plans into, because obviously this is like, you know, he now works on computers, but back in the day, there were all these tubes everywhere. And he had all these colored pencils and like, um compass and like those shapes like plastic you know try rectangles and triangles and things to draw anyway so I think I was just sensitized to thinking about um the fact that the world that we see around us was made by someone um made by people like my dad and you know literally the buildings were obviously but but he has clients who hire him to do things and they have a sense in mind of what they want the building to be and how much they want to spend on it and that that like shapes you know what that shapes the potential of the building basically and therefore shapes the experience of the that place in the world that the people who live and work there are going to have and so I think yeah that for for someone maybe who was given to um daydreaming and reading stories about other people that was just such a um such a rich kind of place to come from and and so yeah I think he's his his industry shaped the way my life and my thinking you know evolved after that but he is descended from engineers and builders and you know his his like father his my dad's father his grandfather and great grandfather, they all worked in New York City as engineers and built the bridges and tunnels, either as, you know, like working on the project as engineers or like literally helping to dig it. Um, I think that gives me a very strong sense of um, belonging in New York that will never go away, even as I kind of change and, and become something slightly different. Like that's why New York will always be home. Mm. One of the various moments of recognition I experienced when reading your Gornick essay was the admission you make. For me, the most rewarding reading is when you cannot summarise the work or say what it is about. Something will always evade your attempt. This then feels like the perfect time to usher Georges Perec into the room. Even though, look at his face, even if you can see it, even though he is of course already here. Um, for those who are listening who don't know him, um, will you give us a brief outline of who he was? Yeah, Georges Perec um, is just one of my favourite people, you know, point final, like whether or not he's, he's, he's no longer with us. But um, yeah, even if I hadn't loved his writing, I still would love the guy. Um, so he he was the son of Polish immigrants to France and grew up in Belleville in the northeast of Paris and um, his father was a soldier once the war came, um, what they call the phony war at the time, the little bit of time when France was still fighting Germany and was killed um, during that period, I think in 1940, 39, something like that. Um, And then his mother was gassed at Auschwitz and he was raised by, well, he was hidden during the war by cousins in the countryside. And then he was raised by, by cousins um, in Paris. And so the loss of his parents, understandably in this you know, murderous genocidal war was formative for him. And the work that he made as a result um, is always grappling with what it means um, to be free in the world and what it means to be 
trapped by the past and how how you can deal with that as a writer. Um, so, you know, I won't go into all of his many literary experiments with, with memory and form and place, but the one that specifically spoke to me um, for this book is, for the bus book, is um, a, a kind of a long essay called An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris, where he went to the Place Saint-Sulpice um, on the left bank for a few days, I think, is it 1974 or 75? I can never remember which, in October, right around now. Um, and sat at a cafe and tried to write down everything he saw. So how do you how do you do that? It is actually very challenging um, to note absolutely everything. I mean, when you think like, just look around you at the moment, like there's so many things happening and there are so many things to notice. It's just impossible. Um, so what I take from that is um, something to do with like the way that we have to acknowledge that we have a particular gaze on the world, a look, as you were just saying, um, and that we can only take in so much and that who we are is going to condition what we see, that there is no um, kind of, there's no way of being objective. Every person in the city is having subjective experience of it. Um, and therefore our experience of life itself is never, we can never pull back and get, you know, a kind of bird's eye view of it. Um, we can study and study and read and speak to people and be in, be in the world and live our lives, but we will only ever at best be noticing and accounting for some small fraction of what, you know, the richness of, of life. So yeah, I think he's, he's a very important um, kind of philosophical thinker and writer, as well as a like completely hilarious and ludic um, and prankster and essayist. Um. I do adore him too. So <laughs> it was wonderful to come upon him so often, not in in all your work, really. I haven't read your first book, which you co-authored, which was about Ulipo. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just I, there's something there's something about the playfulness and and yet the holding at the same time of this grief of the absence that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know it's the that's probably why I cherish him so much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I read your latest published work the Parisian bus diary during our most recent lockdown which has only lately ended you might have heard that Melbourne during this age of COVID became the most locked down city in the world which is not in any way a political statement but it was in this context I kind of came to your book and I felt something akin to when I read the third of Deborah Levy's living autobiography series real estate which I had done during another one of our lockdowns Levy is also a recent contributor to the Jewish quarterly both your books embodied a sense of movement albeit in very different ways there's something really rhythmic that happens in Parisian bus diary, a push pull of movement and stasis that was both thrilling as a counterpoint and mirrored what I was experiencing. Were you conscious of this as you revisited the notes you had held on to when you com contemplated whether they could take a book form? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about the genesis of this book. Yeah. Um... So I think I was thinking about um, a sort of rhythm or a shape to the journeys, but they they are, as you find them in this book, like exactly as they were in, in life. So the book came about because I was on these two buses to and from the school where I was, the university where I was teaching at the time. Um, and I had just gotten an iPad, a little, or sorry, an iPad, an I iPhone, like a little yellow iPhone. And was kind of enjoying the, the the novelty of not having to take out my moleskin and my pen to like make notes when I needed to, whether it was, you know, profound observations about the nature of life in Paris or just like to things I had to remember to do later. Um, and so I started really like abusing the notes app on my iPhone and using it all the time, making all of these notes. And I became kind of like addicted to 
the process of, of like going directly from brain to phone. Um, and yeah, this one day I was, I was on the bus pretty early on, like September, October, something like that. And I noticed a sign on the wall that said, your telephone is precious, please be vigilant when using it. And I was like, my telephone is precious. It was very expensive. I hadn't had an iPhone before that because I couldn't really afford one. Um, but so I, I, I bought myself one when I, I think I got this job and had sold flannels recently. And so I had this phone and thought I'm going to be vigilant with my phone, but I'm going to use it to carry out a vigil. I'm going to use it to like notice everything that's happening around me. And because I was writing flannels at that time, I think I was kind of training myself um, in taking these notes to to be more of a noticer because you know I definitely identify with the this figure of the flaneuse I think that I that I am one I love to walk in cities and just kind of amble around but to write that book I had to like go into you know hyperactive walking and noticing mode and so writing this book was actually I think a way of um of like training myself to write flaneuse in a weird way and yes yeah, so I I put it together as a book not long after this was this period of time ended it was probably 2016 that I put it together and then um, gave it to my agent and she tried to sell it to my publishers and they were like you know nice about it but didn't think that it was a book really or if it was a book it wasn't for them and so I was very discouraged and I put it away and then when we went into lockdown um, in Liverpool in early 2020 that's when I just was like well I'm gonna try again. I, I have nothing to lose. I'm just gonna send it to Chris Cross and send me a text and see if she likes it. Maybe it's like a weird enough book that, that they would go for it. Um, and they did. So that was how that, that came about. Um, and yeah, it felt like an interesting moment in retrospect. I wasn't thinking about it then as lockdown happened, but in retrospect, there must've been something going on subconsciously where I felt like I'd been you know trapped in my house and now I wanted to think about what it was like to be on a bus, you know, squashed up against other people for 20 minutes. And the bus feels like a microcosm for society, the way we share space. Do we stand up for another? Will mm -hmm. another stand up for us? Man spreading, woman spreading, the way we observe people, the way we are seen, what we overhear. How aware of those things were you before you embarked upon the project? Oh, very. I mean, everybody who lives in a city, I think, is like constantly pissed off at like someone who didn't like, I don't know, those people who like get off the metro or the bus, like, uh, oh, no, no, sorry. It's when you're getting off the bus or the metro and like someone's getting on and they won't let you get off. And it's like, dude, you know, stand aside your time will come. I'm just going to step out and then you can step in and that's how it works. You know, there's, there's, we're all very invested in like the social niceties of our experience of public transport. And, and, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm a New Yorker that I, I am a bit more crotchety about it, but I, I tend to think it's not just a New York thing. <laughs> I, um, there is in this book too, the collision of public collective grief and personal grief which again echoes the contemporary reality of readers. And um, so I wondered how it was for you to revisit it. Oh, at, at the moment of, of lockdown, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, I felt almost, it almost felt on, on some level self-indulgent to be worried about my own, you know, ectopic pregnancy, but it was at a, enough of a, uh, uh, sorry, what's the word? It was remove. enough. Enough time had passed. Yeah, I had enough of a remove. Thank you. That I, I wasn't. Um, I didn't feel the pain of the ectopic pregnancy anymore. I mean, I have my son now. I'm with a different person now than I was then. Like, you know, it was obviously a horrible thing to go through. But in in my life, it wasn't um, too significant of a loss because I'm very happy with the way that my life, you know, went after that. Um, but it did feel like, you know, there's so much death and despair happening around me. I and mean, this is also the summer of the Black Lives Matter protests in, in America and, you know, after George Floyd's death. Um, and so it also felt like, hmm, <laughs> white lady has a, a, a miscarriage, feels sad. Um, so I think that I, I sort of, in the, in the, 
I did a kind of introduction, kind of a postscript to it, and then and brought in an essay that I'd written after the um, the attacks in November of 2015, um, and tried to give it a kind of framing that made it feel a bit like you know this is what I was going through, and you know as I learned from Georges Perec, as I was just saying, like we can only really speak from our our corners. You know, I cannot as a white woman speak about black suffering in America, but I can speak to it from my own experience of, of sadness and loss. Um, so I think what I was trying to do was emphasize the degree to which you don't have to be from a particular background to bring empathy and solidarity. Um, I didn't knock on wood personally lose anyone to COVID, but that doesn't mean that I can't bring solidarity and empathy to the public forum, you know, in which we grieve for the people who who we lost, um, or the people who other people lost, but we as a as a community lost. So I think, you know, in, at the end of the day, it was a the publishing this book then was a gesture at community and a kind of reminder that we are in one, even when we're not literally out there in the world in one together, if that makes any sense. Mm. Um, I also want to note that the book is perhaps more so with its kind of pattern of glossy nostalgia, somewhat like a glorious Super 8 film, a celebration <laughs> of fleshy proximity of a time when coughing on a bus was a mere trifle or, um, you know, an ode to French style. So there there are all those things as well. Yeah, definitely. God, the days when you could cough on a bus and not everybody like turned around and looked at you like, oh, do you have the plague? Are you giving us the plague? Um, God. And yeah, I mean, it's very important to me as someone who writes about Paris and France um, that I not be promoting some kind of mythology of the city because, you know, like it's a real city. It's a real place with real people who live there, even, you know, you get a lot of people writing about Paris like it's a museum city and only rich white people live there. That is not the case. Like definitely Paris is a problem in the sense that most of its marginal people have been pushed to the suburbs, but there are still lots of different kinds of people living within the, um, the, the, the ring road, I guess, um, of the city. And so, you know, Paris, it's important to me to convey or explore what it means to live in Paris today in a city that is very beautiful, where there is a lot of importance placed on, you know, um, it's a very homogenous society. Fashion in Paris is, is tends to be a certain, <clears throat> excuse me, obey certain codes. There's there's an Instagram account called Parisians in Paris. Um, and it's great, I love it, but it's always just like white women with long hair, you know, wearing a certain kind of coat and a certain kind, you know, the pant is like, the pant leg is cut at a certain place and it's like a certain kind of shoe. Um, so there's like variations on a theme. So in, in a place that's so interested in exterior signs of, of like canniness or knowing or savviness or like social belonging, um, what does it mean then to to be at an angle to that either because you're not from there or because you're not you know rich white woman um and and yeah so i think you know we can both revel in the fact that paris is a beautiful place with beautiful people in it and acknowledge that it's a real place with real people and that 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 myth is enjoy enjoyable to a certain extent but also does france and paris specifically a disservice to only see it through that lens um, and then there's like a, an amount of personal protest as well. You know, I remember when I first moved to London years and years ago in 2010 or 12 or something like that, I was at a literary party and I think I was working on Flenna's at the time. And th some like older man was like, oh, an American writing about Paris. And it was like, he patted me on the head and it was like, fuck off, dude. Like, fuck the, rest, fuck the hell off. Like, seriously, you know, it's, it, I feel, I feel this great sense of, of, like indignity that that this American in Paris um, label still exists and gets you know applied to people who've lived there a long time and really know the place and know the language and know the culture and have had to apply for visas and you know electricity accounts and navigated 
all of the bullshit that is everyday life in France, you know, like it's 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 infuriating. So yeah, I think it's important um, to to write about Paris in a way that is kind of multifaceted, that enjoys the myth, but also you know takes it apart. Um, I think that man might have come up to me in my years living in London and said uh -huh. something about me being an Antipodean. <laughs> so um, yeah, that same guy. He goes to all the parties and craps <laughs> on all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, were there particular works of art during this age of the pandemic um, or books that spoke to you or were a source of solace? Um, I'm sure there were. I think most recently I've been looking at the paintings of Maria Lasnig, who's uh, who is an Australian, not Australian, Austrian, speaking to an Australian about an Austrian artist. Um, she died in 2014 when she was like 96 or something like that, you know, had a, had a nice long life. And she did a lot of self-portraits where um, she depicts herself, uh, what it, she calls them body awareness paintings. So she's trying to paint not what she looks like. She's not representing herself from an external point of view, but she's trying to point herself, paint herself from like the inside out. So like right now I'm sitting with my elbow on the arm of this chair and my hand is kind of floating up here. Don't know why, but um, she would paint like the, the pressure of the elbow on the chair and the pressure of like the hip on the chair, my hip, the way that I'm sitting, my legs are crossed. She's just trying to like find a way to represent that. And sometimes her, char her characters, her paintings don't have hair because she don't, you don't feel your hair. Um, and so they're just, they're like these phenomenological paintings of being a body in the world and you know when she's much older and she's going she, she goes to hospital she paints the experience of being a body in hospital um and yeah so I mean some in some of them she has like a cheese grater for a head or she becomes kind of like a robot um she paints herself as a monster uh it's 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 just a really interesting range of like visual renderings of of what it is to be embodied. Um, and she's she has a lot in common with Parekh, I think, in that respect, that it's very much, her work is very much about um, subjectivity and, and not representation from the outside, but like feeling from the inside. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the title of Gornick's book, Taking a Long Look. So much of what you do, Lauren, encapsulates the long look, the sideways look, the double take, the look deep down into the entrails of the past. And it is such a wonder to witness this through your writing. I encourage all who haven't yet read these books to do so. Um, there is so much to enthrall. And of course, if you haven't yet done so, please subscribe to the Jewish Quarterly if Jewish culture, thought and literature is your thing. Lauren, it has been a real joy. One day, perhaps we might speak in the same room, in the same I space. I love that. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for your very thoughtful, thoughtful, thoughtful questions. And thank you. Thank you, guys. My goodness, that was uh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Tully. Thank you, Lauren. I, I feel I feel absolutely blessed because usually in an interview such as this such as this, we, we get to know one person so much better, the interviewee, but tonight, I just, like all of us watching this, came away with insights in, into both you, Lauren, and your work and your mind, but also, obviously, the incredible Vivian Gornick. So, so thank you to both of you, and, and, and also um, a longing to go to Paris, as everybody probably feels like <laughs> now as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us, and thank you, Tali, for so expertly guiding us through like you always do and and a reminder that lauren's piece is is in the november edition of jewish quarterly along with um a handful or more of incredible articles and essays as it as it always is um just very quickly we have one more live event this year again delivered by the wonderful medium of video and it's our annual summer reading guide which is very popular with with tully um is joined with by uh, by Bram Presser and Alyssa Goldstein, and they'll take you through the books that they've loved and that they recommend that you read over summer. 
It's on Tuesday, 7th of December. Uh, so don't miss that. Until then, to all of you out there, stay well and stay safe. Thank you very much.